Lord, I confess that passages like these are difficult, but this is your word. And your word is given to us for our benefit, for our profit. And so I ask you, God, that you will make it profitable to us. That you will speak to us through your word in areas that we really need to hear from. And that you will change our lives, continue to transform us into your likeness. And may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Each year, um, around October, our kids have something called uh, a curriculum night at their schools, where the class teacher speaks to us about that year's curriculum. But she also lets us know the rules she has ex established for the class. Last year, Alethea's teacher had some really unique rules for her class. And so we went back home thinking, hmm, this teacher must really be good. Why? Because her rules said something about her values. And her values say, said something about who she was as a person. And that's true of our homes as well. The, the rules and the, the principles that we have established in our homes is a reflection of our heart. And what you value and what you treasure is a reflection of who you are as a person. Why do I say all of that? Because in today's passage, there are a number of laws, case laws. And these laws or commands reveal to us the heart of God, what he values and what he is in his character. And God's people are called to live out their lives in the light of who God is and his character. So that's the first of the two truths that I'd like to present to you this morning. So let's just dive into it. Here's the first truth. God's people must live in the light of God's character. We must live in the light of who God is and his character. Now these case laws in this passage can be grouped into different categories. And like I said, each of these flow out of who God is. So let's just go through a few of them and make some applications to ourselves. Here's the first thing. Verse 16 and 17, God is holy, so therefore we must pursue sexual purity. Exodus chapter 22, verse 16 and 17, this is what the Bible says, if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. If a man seduces or lures a woman, a woman of marriageable age, and lies with her, even if it is with her own consent, it is not a light matter before God. There are consequences for it. He has to give the bride price and take her as his wife. Now, if the father refuses to give her to him, because he thinks he's some sort of a scoundrel, he's free to do so, but the man still has to pay the bright price, which would in many cases be wages up to several years. Now this law served to protect women from being treated as sexual objects. No one can just have sex with someone just for fun. 
there are consequences for it. This law also served justice for the father because the daughter belonged to the father and was under the care and the authority of the father. And this man took something that did not belong to him and therefore he had to make things right with the father. But these verses also teach that there is no casual sex for God's people. Sex is sacred. It is a gift from God to be enjoyed only within the boundaries of marriage between a husband and a wife. And every kind of sexual intimacy outside of that is sin before God. Now, if God of the Bible was not holy, he wouldn't have given these commandments. It wouldn't have mattered to him. But the God of the Bible is holy. He does not take sexual sin lightly. He calls his people to live a life of sexual purity. And we see this throughout scriptures. If you come to the New Testament, if you come to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3, this is what Paul says to God's people. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Did you hear that? Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity because these are improper for God's holy people. The world around us will say it is okay. It is fun. It is normal. It will say it's okay to sexually experiment. Sometime back, I, I read somewhere that people are now trying to find out if they are sexually compatible before getting married. But here's what scripture says. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. This is what God's word says. Exodus chapter 22, verse 16, the verse begins with this, these words. If a man seduces a woman... And we must stop and ask ourselves, brother, sister, how do you relate with someone of the opposite sex? Do you flirt with people? How are your conversations and chat? How are your texts with others? Do they cause people to be lured into sin? I want you to know, based on God's word, that God takes this seriously. Some people think our, our aim and goal in life is to look hot to others. And they do everything for it. Because somehow, you know, the world has lied to us that our very purpose of our existence is to somehow look hot to others. But as God's people, our aim is to not look hot to others, but to grow in holiness, in godliness. Desire to be holy, because God desires that for our lives. Here's the next thing that we see in this passage. God is worthy. We must worship him only. If the previous verses speak of a physical adultery, verses 18 to 20 warn us against spiritual adultery. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to, an, uh, to any god other than the Lord God alone shall be devoted to destruction. What are these verses talking about? We have sorcery here. 
which is seeking um, the intervention of evil forces, attempting to gain knowledge of the future or, or control over things or people. And God hates it because it is evil. It is also an attempt to replace God with other means. When someone goes to a, a palm reader or a fortune teller or astrologers or read horoscopes in the newspapers in order to know their future, they are in essence saying, I do not trust God with my future. I need another source. And that's blasphemous. Some of Israel's neighboring nations also practiced some gross, perverted practices like bestiality. And this was part of their cultic worship. Those nations had fertility gods represented by certain animals. And they believed that their union with the animal would somehow give them favor with their gods. And again, God's people were warned against it. They were to trust God, the Lord their God, who is the source and the giver of every good thing. Verse 20 is more explicit. They were not to offer sacrifices to um, any other God, but the Lord alone, because he alone was worthy. He alone was to be trusted and worshipped. And that's true for us as well. Brother, sister, who do you trust in with your future, for your future? Is it God or something else, some other means apart from God? Who, or, um, who do you trust in uh, for your needs? Is it God or something else? Who or what do you bow down before? Is it God or an idol that you have made for yourself? These verses reiterate the first commandment where God says, you shall have no other gods before me because he alone is worthy. He alone must be the God of our lives and nothing else. We're talking about living in the light of God's character. Here's the third thing from this passage. God is compassionate, so therefore we must be compassionate towards the helpless. The relationship between uh, the, the command and the character of God comes out most clearly in these verses. God is compassionate. And therefore, as God's people as those who belong to him, as those who bear his name, must be compassionate towards others, especially those who are weak and helpless. There are four groups of people in these verses. The sojourner, that is the foreigner, the widow, the fatherless, and the poor. And all four groups of people were generally susceptible or prone uh, to be oppressed or taken advantage of by others. And the foreigner, because, uh, the foreigner, because they were uh, in a new land away from the comfort and the security of their own people. The widow, because she was alone. The fatherless, because there was none to defend them. And the poor, because it was easy to exploit them in their poverty and desperation. But we must not miss God's heart in these verses. Twice in these verses, God says that when they cry out, God says, I will surely hear their cry. And why does God do that? He says, because I am compassionate. This is God's heart for the helpless. And so, friend, do you feel helpless this morning? Perhaps you are a, a newcomer to this country. And you've left the security of your family and people. And you're, maybe you're fearful about how things are going to work out for you. 
Or maybe you walked into this place feeling so discouraged or feeling helpless, thinking about this week that is ahead of you, these months that are ahead of you. But I want you to know that God cares for you. He hears your cry. He is the help of the helpless because he is a compassionate God. Or per perhaps you feel alone because your husband uh, passed away. Or maybe because you come from a, a, a broken home. Your husband or, or father perhaps uh, walked out of your life. Let me say this. First of all, I want you to know that we live in a broken world marred by sin. And that's why we experience brokenness in this world. But here's something that you need to see, and that is this. But God does not leave us in our brokenness. He sees your tears. He hears your cry. He is your defender. That's what God is saying. If you do this, listen, be careful, because I'm going to come and defend them. Other parts of scripture says he is the father to the fatherless. He is a compassionate God. That is who God is. Now, because God is compassionate, he's saying what he is asking his people to do. That means we must be compassionate towards our brothers and sisters and people who are going through brokenness in our lives, in their lives. That means we cannot be insensitive and be indifferent toward them. We cannot be uncaring towards the newcomers. We must do everything that we can to, to help them. That means to the fatherless, we men in this church must rise up and be godly father figures to them, to love them, to be concerned for their well-being and defend them, because that is what God does in this passage. We must let love, God's love and compassion, flow to them through our lives. Here's the next thing that we see in terms of who God is and his commands. Verse 28 to 31, we see that God is the owner. God is the source of everything. And therefore, we must honor him with everything. This is what verse 28 means. Now, it, it can be a little confusing. It says, you shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. But this is what it actually means. It means don't revile God by cursing your leaders. Why? Because even the authority that, God, that, that, that is over your life is placed by God. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, all authority comes from God. So honor God by respecting authority in your lives, whether it is civil authorities or parents or shepherds whom God's placed in your life. We not only honor God by how we treat God-ordained authority in our lives, we honor God with everything that we have. Recognizing that we have, what we have is from the hand of God. Verse 29 you shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. This is why we honor God with our first fruits and our tithes and our offerings and not from our leftovers because we acknowledge that it is God who has blessed us with that income. But we not only give God the best of our offering from our income, but if God has given us graciously children, we honor God by giving them back to the Lord. We honor God by committing ourselves 
to bring them up in the ways of the Lord and not in the ways of the world. And not hold them back for ourselves. But we be willing to give completely to the work of the Lord so that they may serve the Lord with their lives. We honor God, not only with our possessions, with our children, but with our very lives by giving our, ourselves to him. Because God not only owns our possessions, but God owns us. And that's why in verse 31, it says, you shall be consecrated to me. Not just the things that you have, but you shall be consecrated to me. And then the next sentence says, therefore, you shall not eat of any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. What does that mean? An animal, let's say a lamb, was killed by another animal. Um, these people were not supposed to eat it because it was considered to be unclean. But in this context, what is God saying? In other words, God is saying to his people, don't give yourself to unclean things, but give yourself to me. Don't give yourself to unclean things, but set yourself apart for me. Be consecrated to me because your life belongs to me. Brother, sister, what are you giving your life to? What unclean things are you giving your eyes to, your hands to, your feet to? What are you giving your lives to? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20 says, You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body. Give yourself to God. You were, you, you were bought with a price. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. This is what Paul says after, you know, talking about the riches of the gospel. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. Holy and acceptable to God. For This is your spiritual act of worship. Give yourself to God. And not one cleanness. Because you belong to God. Here's the third, the final thing that we see under this. God is just. We must be just in our dealings with others. In these verses, God calls his people not to bear a false witness, be partial, not to be partial, not to pervert justice in any way. Why does God care about those things? Why does God want his people to put away falsehood, be impartial and upright and just? Because that is who God is. And that is what God calls us to. When I was a kid, I, I remember singing this song. I don't know if you know it. It's called, I Ascribe Greatness to Our God. And part of that, one of the lines of the song says, a God of faithfulness without injustice, righteous and upright is he. It's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. It says, God is a faithful God who does no wrong and he's upright and just. And God's people, we are called to live in the light of who he is and his character. If we say we belong to Christ, then we must reflect his character through our lives with the help of his spirit. If we say we belong to Christ, then we must become Christ-like. But we not only, this passage teaches us that we not only live in the light of God's character, secondly, we must live in the light of his saving grace. And I know some of you are getting nervous because I'm in my second point, And you're like, you said so many things. You took so much time. And now you're saying in your second point, I'm just going to be very brief here. Twice in this passage, God reminds his people something. Verse 21, 
chapter 22, verse 21, and chapter 23 and verse 9, God says this, You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Once again, in chapter 23 and verse 9, You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. God says to the people of Israel, treat a sojourner well. Do no wrong to them. Do not oppress them, because remember, you were one sojourners in Egypt. You know the heart of a sojourner. You know what it feels how it feels. You know what it means to put yourself in their shoes. So be empathetic towards them. Now that's one layer of interpretation, which is pretty straightforward. But there's another layer of meaning to these verses. Each time the people of Israel were reminded of Egypt, they could not but think of who they were in Egypt, how their lives were in Egypt, and how they were brought out of that. They were slaves in Egypt. And the only reason why they were brought out was because of the grace of God. And it is in the light of this saving grace they were ultimately called to live. Why should they obey these commandments? Why should they pursue holiness and worship God only and treat people well, be just and upright and honor God with their very lives? It's because of the grace of God in their lives. Brother, sister, what is the motivation for our obedience to God? Why should we pursue holiness and sexual purity? Why should we put God here and worship him only? Why should we treat people with love and compassion? And why should we honor our God with everything that we have, with our very lives? Why? Because of the saving grace of God. He brought us out of our darkness into his light. He saved you and me through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why we obey him and live for him. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 15 says, Paul says this, And he died for all, that those who might live no longer, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who, for him who, for their sake, died and was raised. Brother and sister, Jesus died and was raised for our sake, for our salvation. How can we continue to live for ourselves? We must live for him. We must live in obedience to his word and his commandments with the help of his spirit, for the glory of his name. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, before you can even think about obeying, because you can't obey these laws of God. Before you, even you can, before you can even think about it, you must first experience the saving grace of God. You must repent of your sins and, and trust in Jesus and his finished work of salvation for you. And as you trust, he will forgive you. And he'll give you a new life. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you can live in the light of his grace, pleasing and glorifying him. So will you put your trust in Jesus this morning? Let's look to God in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your great mercy that you have made us your own people, that we belong to you.
and you call us to live in the light of who you are and in your character, O oh God. So help us. Help us. Lord, every time we feel, Lord, that we should live our lives in our own way, remind us that we belong to you, that we are called to reflect you through our lives. Lord, remind us, Lord, how much you have done for us. Remind us of the saving grace that we might live in the light of your grace, O oh God. Lord, if there is anyone here who does not know you, would you please continue to minister to their hearts that they may know that you love them and that you have done everything on behalf for, for them, O oh God. That they might, Lord, see their own need for a savior in their lives and turn to you and put their trust in you. We thank you for who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.